my subject this morning is a certain hope in the risen Christ. A certain hope in the risen Christ. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now, both our message this morning and this evening will be centred on those two words, but now, pivotal words which change our thinking. A hopeless life in verse 19, but in verse 20, but now, is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? So our subject is a certain hope in Christ. When the Bible mentions the word hope, it's not some vague, wishy-washy, wishful thinking. It tells us of a certain knowledge, confidence, expectation that we can have built on solid truth, on the certain statements that the Bible has. And we shall consider some of these in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. The question posed by verse 19 is this. What is your hope for the life to come? It speaks of two lives. This life, the life that we're now living, and the life <coughs> that is to come. It says, verse 19, If in this life only, the life that we now live, we have hope, the implication is that in the life to come, we have no hope. No hope. Because the resurrection has been a hoax. The resurrection has just been made up. It was some clever scheme and plan concocted perhaps by the Romans. And these apostles, these disciples, the women, they were just deluded, deceived. And so are we as Christians and the church. That's the argument that's going to be put before us this morning by the Apostle Paul as he writes from Ephesus to the church at Corinth. You see, they've been hoping, they've been trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ in this life. And on that basis, they felt they had confidence that after death, the death that all of us will come to one day, and then the judgment, which the Bible speaks clearly of, which we know, deep down in our hearts and our consciences tell us that one day we will be accountable for the lives that we've lived. They were hoping that after they died there would be a resurrection. They would be raised from death. Their never dying souls would live. They would be immortal. But Verses 12 to 19, which will be our subject this morning, and the verses that will take the arguments mostly from, Paul is going to give a great logic chain. He's going to say, if, 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 seven times. Verse 12, if Christ. Verse 13, if there be no resurrection. Verse 14, if Christ, and so on. Seven times, one statement leads to the other. A great chain of logic to prove the resurrection. And the great crescendo is verse 20. But now, is Christ risen from the dead? Well, that's our assertion this morning. That's our contention that Christ is risen. We want to try to prove from the Bible and with some arguments and reasons for why we can be certain that Christ did rise from the dead, that this is no hoax, that our faith is not built on some flimsy evidence, but it's built on solid, sure, fact, logic, argument, and reason. So this is the heart of the matter this morning. There are really these two questions. Do you believe that Christ 
was raised from the dead. And on the back of that, do you believe that we as Christians, if we are in Christ, trusting in him for the forgiveness of sin, do we believe that we too will be raised from the dead? Well, this is Easter Day. This is the day that traditionally, we don't much go by tradition or by the so-called church calendar, we are independents as Baptists. And we go by the word of God. We don't go by the number of Sundays before Lent or after Ascension. We go by the word of God. But it's good and appropriate to remember that Christ did rise from the dead. Every Sunday to us is the time that we remember that the Lord is risen. But particularly this day. Christ's resurrection is fundamental to our Christian faith. It's one of those few truths that the whole of the Christian faith is built on. You take that one away and you take away the construction, the foundation upon which our faith is believed and which we trust. Well, we live in a time where many others do not believe in the resurrection from the dead. I read an opinion poll this week that was done a couple of years ago. In Britain, less than 50% of people believe in any afterlife. That's astonishing. That's changed so much in the last 20, 30 years and the last 500 years. In this country, it would have been believed by the vast majority. Only 17% believed in a literal, factual, actual resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And if you ask men, they were even more disbelieving. And if you ask 18 to 24 year olds, they were the least believing of all the groups that were asked. Well, we don't much go by opinion. There are as many opinions are there as, uh, as there are people we want to go by something that doesn't change, that has authority, that's attested, that's proven, that can be stood up to be tested. So we say, what does the Bible say? And that's what we will look at this morning. But there were those that did not believe in Paul's time, in Corinth. And that's what he's going to address. Verse 12. Now, if Christ be <coughs> preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, some in the church perhaps, or in the city of Corinth that was saying, no, Christ didn't rise from the dead, and therefore there is no general resurrection after death. There is no afterlife, there is no eternity. And that's what he's going to confront, as he often does, head on, directly challenging the issue. But there was another group. There was a religious group. We thought about them last Sunday in passing in the book of Acts. They were called the Sadducees. And they did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in a saviour. They didn't believe in a messiah. They perhaps are typical of the established church today. The Church of England, where there are many bishops, that openly, vocally, do not believe in a literal resurrection. They think that this life is all the life that there is to live. And they certainly don't think that the Lord Jesus actually, factually, rose from the dead. So there are many groups that don't believe then and now. So do we believe in an actual resurrection for Christ? and for us. Well, we're going to look at this chapter. 1 Corinthians 13 is the famous chapter of love, defining love. We thought of that a few weeks ago. 1 Corinthians 15 is the great treatise, great work. 58 verses telling us of the resurrection. It's an amazing account. An amazing treatment of this subject. Did 
Christ rise? He did. How would he rise? How was it a fulfilment of prophecy? Will we rise? We will. What will it be like? What will our bodies be like in the resurrection? All of these questions are dealt with. So let's turn to these verses. This letter to the Corinthians was written around AD 53-54 from Ephesus by Paul to the church at Corinth. One of three letters. We only have two contained in the canon of the scripture. There was another letter, apparently. It was written to Corinth at a time when the population was around 600,000 people. It was a bustling city, a cosmopolitan city, a trading route, where many came with their opinions and their ideas from where they had last travelled from, and these were shared. And so it's not surprising that at Corinth, they had confusing, conflicting ideas, even just 20 years or so after the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. So Paul confronts the issue in verse 12. He's going to set out this chain of logic. He's going to tell them it's unreasonable not to believe in the resurrection. He's going to say, but if we don't believe it, our faith is in vain and we remain in our sin under the judgment of our sin. And our faith is pointless. It's a waste of time. The whole church is a fabrication. The Christian faith, it's all been made up. That's the only logical conclusion if you do not believe the resurrection. Verse 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, no general resurrection, no afterlife, then is Christ not risen. The two go together, he's arguing. Verse 14, if Christ be not risen, then is our teaching, our preaching vain, empty, a waste of time, and so is your faith. <clears throat> Also, vain. It was only for this life. It's not for the life hereafter. It's not for eternity. Verse 15. Yea, we are found false witnesses. We who saw, I saw the risen Saviour. He met me on that road. That road when I was going to murder said Saul who was breathing great threatenings on the road to Damascus, the road where he was taken by shock and surprise. And the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him, an apostle born out of due time. He didn't meet the normal qualifications to be an apostle, but instead the Lord gave him the apostleship because he had that qualification because the Lord appeared to him he makes this argument we are found to be false witnesses verse 16 for if the dead rise not up after death then Christ is not raised he comes the other way round verse 17 and if Christ be not raised up your faith is in vain. If, if, if the logic chain set out so clearly before us. And then he says in verse 17, and if Christ be not raised up, ye are yet in your sins. You see, that's what this is all about. The whole message of the gospel. If you look back at the beginning of the chapter, this is what he taught them. This is what the church believed, he says, and reminds them in verse 1. I declare, I teach, I preach, I set out before you the gospel, the unchanging good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, which you also received. I received it, you received it. 
and wherein you stand. That's the basis of your faith. That's the foundation that you've built on. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved. This is about salvation. If there's no resurrection, there's no salvation. If there's no salvation, there's no resurrection. There's no gospel. There's no church. There's no faith. You can't just take one of those props, those great pillars holding up the structure of the faith away and expect nothing to happen. He says, verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for sins. Here's the twin pillars, the two pillars. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, just as it was laid out in Isaiah 53, that wonderful chapter that we read on Friday, fulfilled to the letter, to the dot, to the crossing of the T, fulfilled in every detail, just as the scripture promised, Christ died for our sins. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Verse 4, and then, as we know, he was buried. He had to be buried. They took the bodies away so soon in those Eastern ancient times. And then he rose again the third day, again according to the scriptures. This is all laid out in the word of God. You can see these things in the book of Genesis. You can see it throughout the prophecies. It's so clear. It's so evident for us all to see. If only we will look for it. That's the arguments that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ is not the only one that will rise up from the dead. So will all true believers. Look down at verse 42. I'm jumping around deliberately. There's too much here for us to cover. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42. So also is the general resurrection of the dead, the resurrection that applies to all of us. It is sown in incorruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonour. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. You see, we die. Our bodies, they decompose. But one day, all who are in Christ will be given a spiritual body. And just like Christ rose again with a body that couldn't be touched, our bodies will be risen again and we will have a spiritual, eternal body. You see, the body isn't everything. It's the soul that counts. Our never dying soul. Well, I want us to look this morning at some of the reasons that the sceptics should consider and anyone that's wavering in their faith. How do we know that this resurrection is true? Why is it so believable? and plausible and trustworthy and not some elaborate hoax. Well, my first reason this morning is a sort of circular reason. <clears throat> the fact of conversion. The fact that there are those whose lives are completely changed. They've left their sin. They've left their drink. They've left their life full of hopelessness, helplessness. They've left their immoral lives. They've left their sin, their lying, their stealing. We read of so many characters in the Word of God and we know in the Church of Jesus Christ, those who were in prison for breaking the laws of the land, but all of us who've been taken out of captivity to Satan. The fact of conversion argues for the resurrection. How's that so? Well, as Paul says here, if there's no faith, 
there's no resurrection. Well, we turn it around. There is a faith. We know there's a faith. We know that lives are changed. We know that Christ died for sinners individually. And therefore we can argue, circular argument, that there must be and that there is a resurrection. There is a faith, so there must be a resurrection of Christ and of when we die. But secondly, the Bible is a conspicuously honest and accurate book. We read of warts and all in the Bible. It's one of those books that doesn't hide the sins, the failings, the fallings of its heroes and characters. You read the autobiographies of great men. They don't tell you what they did. Great women, they don't tell you of their three, four marriages that were broken. They don't tell you of the things that they did that were dishonest, just to grab power. No, we think of David. The Bible is honest about David's sin. We think about Peter, that disciple that was with the Lord Jesus for three years. He walked with him for three years through Galilee. And yet, not once, but three times, he denied the faith. So when the Bible tells us that there was an empty tomb and a two-ton, as the experts tell us, rock that was put across the grave that was rolled away and a guard of soldiers, we know that the witness is reliable. And the account of the women that went to the grave that first morning their witness is reliable. The Bible is reliable. The Bible has been attested by archaeology and by history and found to have no errors. But thirdly, we can look even at secular things. We can see in Roman archaeology that there are records telling us that in Rome, in the first couple of centuries, there was great concern amongst the rulers in the Roman Empire, that the Jewish nation was spreading. They were going from city to city, Ephesus, Corinth, all <coughs> these places. The great displacement of the Jews. And it's recorded that it seems the conviction that they had was built on a strong belief of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even secular historians in Rome. But then we can say that if this was an elaborate hoax, they went about it in a very strange way. The testimony of women was not accepted in law courts in the first century AD. If you're going to construct and write a hoax, why would you record that the first women, the first people, to go to the grave were women. Those whose testimonies would not be believed, would not be held up in a court. And yet it was Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of the Lord Jesus, and Joanna that went to the grave and whose testimony was brought back to the other disciples. And Peter and John go running together. They have a running contest. And John got there first, but because he was the more timid, he waited outside. And bold Peter goes and marches in and sees the grave clothes in two piles where the Lord Jesus had laid accurate, detailed descriptions of what they saw. No, you wouldn't go about constructing a hoax in that way. And then, of course, we can think of all the apostles, the disciples that became apostles. Most of them died the death of martyrs. You might die for something you believe in, something that's true, but you wouldn't die if you knew or you'd been part of a hoax. Eleven of them dying. One of them didn't die a death of a martyr, but most of them. It's inconceivable to think 
that the apostles would willingly give their lives for something that they had made up and been part of. But then there's another argument, and it's very clearly stated in this chapter. We see some of the evidences in verse 5. He was seen of Peter, then of the twelve, then above 500 people at once, and then of James, then again of the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also, Paul, as one born out of due time, verse 8. In fact, if you look at all the New Testament, there are at least 12 separate occasions recorded of those who saw the risen Saviour. Probably six to seven hundred separate eyewitness accounts, over 500 on one occasion, and then the list of 11 other occasions on which the Lord Jesus demonstrated to eyewitnesses, reliable people, people that had so much to lose if they came forward and said, I've seen the risen Saviour with mine own eyes. But then there's the argument about the guards, the Roman guards. Soldiers, they don't go to sleep when they've been asked to guard a tomb and openly allow the body to be stolen, especially when it was a tomb that was well known and when your life depends upon it and when there's been a seal, a rope covered with clay wrapped around the tomb, the Roman seal, that the tomb had been closed and it was stolen in the very eyesight and the hearing of the soldiers? No, not possible. When an atheist once wrote a book setting out to list all the arguments, a book called Who Moved the Stone? The conclusion of his book was that this was a divine miracle. It wasn't a hoax. He set out to prove that it was. His conclusion was there was so much overwhelming evidence that this was a miracle. This was a fact, actually happened. But then we can think of the apostles themselves. We've been thinking of them in our series on the book of Acts. These fishermen, ordinary, plain men, uneducated, people of no great eloquence, no great education, and yet they were remarkably transformed. Peter and John, as we thought of last Sunday, who stood before the Sanhedrin, tested, tested as to what they had done in healing the lame man. Peter and John standing up giving witness to what they had seen. They mentioning the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and the conclusion of these religious bigots, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the priests, who had every incentive not to give testimony was that these men, Peter and John, they had been with Jesus been with the risen Jesus in those 40 days after he rose again, when he taught them, and then the 10 days after he ascended, when they reflected on what they had learned before the day of Pentecost. No, these men were remarkably transformed. There's no other explanation for it. But then we can think of a secular much respected historian, Josephus, whose writings are so loved and so reviewed and so held up as being actually, factually correct. He acknowledges the historicity of Jesus' death and resurrection. But finally, perhaps the strongest argument of all, the whole of the Old Testament sets out for us in numerous hundreds of prophecies, pictures, pointing forward to the fact that the Lord Jesus would come and that he would die 
but his work was not completed until he proved that the cross and the crucifixion and his atonement had been successful and that it was complete because he had risen from the dead. So these are just some of the reasons. No wonder Paul can say in verse 20, but now, now is Christ risen from the dead. We don't need to have any doubt about it. This was not a hoax. This is certain. This is clear. We have a faith. We have a faith that's built squarely on the resurrection. The word of God is reliable. We can believe it. Paul's arguments are clear. Christ rose, we will rise. The only question to close with is this. Are you in Christ? Are you in the faith, as it says here? If you do not have a faith, you will not be part of that general resurrection who are in Christ. Your faith is empty because it's not in Christ. But if you are found in Christ, united to him, trusting him, knowing that your sins are forgiven, as it says, as we looked at, at the beginning of the chapter, Christ died for our sins. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved. Have you been saved? Have you had your sins forgiven and washed? Did Christ die for you? Well, all who come to him, I can tell you with confidence, on the mandate, on the authority of the word of God, all who come to Christ for the forgiveness of sin, all will be in Christ on that general day of resurrection. He died, he rose again. We will all die. We do not know when. We feel so fragile at this time. We feel the loss of loved ones. We feel for those whose life hovers on the edge, those in care homes, those on ventilators. These things make us think. They make us think of our death and of what lies beyond the grave. There is an eternity. There is an afterlife. The question is, where will you spend that eternity? I'm not giving you my opinion this morning. These things are not made up. I'm merely seeking to explain what God's word says. God's word which has such authority. It's been tested and attested by all these things that we've covered. We can say that we are certain that the witness of Christ is not in vain. We can be certain that our faith and the preaching of Christ is not in vain. And we can be certain, along with Paul, that now is Christ risen from the dead and therefore we have a certain hope in the risen Christ. And we're thankful for him today. And we can say, Christ is risen from the dead. And therefore we have a sure, a certain hope in Christ that one day we shall be with him and we shall rise with all that countless number of believers who've put their trust in him and whose faith is not in vain and we are no longer in and bound by our sin. Well, may this be helpful to us this morning. We're going to close our worship singing.